Welcome to the Caribbean Cricket Podcast, your one-stop shop for all things West Indies cricket, by the fans, for the fans. listen to the Caribbean Cricket Podcast. Indeed you are, indeed you are. My name is Marshall St. Patrick Hewitt, one half of the Caribbean Cricket Podcast, and welcome back to another episode, another edition. By now, you should know how we do. If you're brand new to the Caribbean Cricket Podcast, we are the number one self-declared, number one independent media venture covering West Indies cricket, boys, girls, men's, women everything. We speak to all the key stakeholders. If you've never come across us before, go follow on the audio platform, podcast platform of your choosing. Go listen to all of our previous episodes. They're all brilliant. Or you can go on YouTube and go back through the archive and listen to whatever you want to listen to, etc, etc. Um, at the time of recording this, news has just dropped. I haven't decided yet if I'm going to do a separate video on it, but of course, let's just make immediate reference to it. Shea Hope has just been announced as the West Indies' new ODI captain, and Robin Powell has been announced as the new West Indies T20 captain. None of those two things are massively surprising to me. The only question mark about any of that was always going to be, would Robin get both? I think most people expected Robin... In fact, you'd have to be a dunce to have not known that Robin was going to get the T20 captaincy. That was obvious. From the minute Talawar's won CPL, and then Scorp Jamaica Scorpions won... Um, Super 50, Rothman had to get the T20 captaincy. It was just whether the selectors felt that Rothman's place in the ODI squad, bear in mind he'd recently been dropped, was secure enough to give him the ODI captaincy as well. If Rothman's place in the ODI squad was secure, Rothman would also be the ODI captain. As it is, we must all remember that in the Super 50 that concluded at the end of November uh, last year, Rothman was the top run scorer as the Scorpions won the title. So Rothman, when, when the ODI squad is announced for South Africa, I'm expecting Rothman's name to be in there as well. But I, I, I understand it. I can't, I can't hate on the selectors for giving it to Hope. Hope should have got it after, after, um, after Pollard stood down in the first place. If people remember, when Pollard took the captaincy in 2019, back in the 2019, Hope was the ODI vice-captain. Puran was the T20 vice captain. What I would love to understand is when Pollard stepped down, what was the conversation to say, right, give both captaincies to Puran? Because what was the point of grooming Hope as vice captain to then have Puran jump over him and take both the LGI captaincy and the T20 captaincy? And that may well have gone part of the way to burning Puran out, you know. We should have always just, we should have followed the plan. The plan was set. Hope take old Jai captaincy, Puran, T -T Puran take T20 captaincy, and let's keep it moving. Probably what prevented them doing so is they didn't want three separate captains, Craig in Tess, Hope in ODI, Puran in T20. Well, guess what? We're here now anyway. So we should have just followed the plan from the get-go, and we may not have even been in this situation. But it is what it is. Big up Shea Hope. I hope it goes well. He's got one hell of a task on his hands. We're going to be in the World Cup qualifiers come, come June when we have to go back to Zimbabwe to try and navigate our way out of a 10-team tournament that will include Scotland, Ireland, Sri Lanka, um, Netherlands, just to name them to begin with. No guarantee we even make it to the, to the ICC ODI World Cup at the end of the year. So Shea Hope, all all powers to you from from us at the Caribbean Cricket Podcast and the brand new coach, whether that ends up being as well, whether it be Andre Coley or somebody else, etc. And big up Rothman Powell, like I say, that was expected. Big up to Rothman. Hope it all goes well. What an intro, because normally I don't start like that. What I try to do is I say, look at the ticker tape below or read the description in the video. You can find the Caribbean Cricket Podcast on Twitter and Instagram at Carib Cricket. Join the movement, become one of the followers. You can find us on Facebook, just type in Caribbean Cricket Podcast. Everybody gets let in. 
I just might stop some of your posts if you post a bag of nonsense and foolishness. But more importantly of all, if you're watching on YouTube, like, share, subscribe to the Caribbean Cricket Podcast. We're currently on the road to 5K. You helped us get to 4K. Now we're on the road to 5K. So subscribe to the video. Click that notification button so that whenever we drop something, it always you always get that notification to your phone or email or whatever it is to let you know that we've dropped some fire for you to listen to. If you'd like to support us in another way financially, because we don't have a sponsor, our sponsorship that we do get is from you, the fans being patrons. Um, you can head to www.patreon.com forward slash carib cricket. And for as little as two of whatever your local currency is, you can just help us along the way. You know, I call that two pounds or two dollars or whatever it is that people contribute. Call it like half a coffee. Uh, but ultimately, it helps us keep going so that we can pay to be on things like StreamYard and make sure that we're paying to a uh, whole star podcast and get out there and so on and so forth. So thank you to anyone who's already a patron. If you want to become one, head to the website below. But anyways, let's move. Let's move. Let's keep it moving. The purpose of this particular um, episode is to hand out the player ratings. The, the Zimbabwe series is over. West Indies secured the 1-0 win. If it hadn't rained in the first test, I think it would have been a 2-0. Sorry, if it hadn't rained out an entire day, um, in the first test, it possibly probably would have been a 2-0 win. But we win and we keep it moving. It now means that in West Indies' last nine tests, we've only lost twice. And both of them away to Australia, a place where we're not expected to win, much less compete. So we're moving. We're moving. We licked down England, licked down Bangladesh, and now we licked down Zimbabwe. Up next, South Africa. But there's different videos to come about South Africa in the forthcoming days. Content can't done. But let's hand out the series player ratings, people, because this is what this is for. Starting at the top, Tejan Ryan Shandapur, the top run scorer for the West Indies across the series. 258 runs, at an average of 129, largely built off the back of his first test on beaten maiden double century. 207 not out, continuing his fantastic form and adaptation to test cricket after being thrown into the fire um, in Australia. He currently averages 70 after his first seven innings in test match cricket. Big up, Tej. I mean, he didn't cash in. In fairness, Tej didn't cash in after that um, 207. His, his last three innings were 15 and 36, but we can't hold that against him. 207. And across the series, you have to give him a 9.5. Do, do, you, do you know how many players will go through their test career and never get a century, much less a double century? Uh, Tasia's got that inside his first seven test match innings um, and multiple 50s as well. So big up Tej. Um, and yeah, 9.5 for Tej. Craig Brathwaite, winning captain. There was some criticism of Craig about his tactics in the first test and in terms of using his bowlers and some people wanted to have a pop at him about field placings in the first test and could and should we have batted quicker, could and should we have pushed for a win in the first test. But ultimately, it's another series victory for Craig Brathwaite. Three out of his last four series, he's oh, he's presided over West Indies winning them, okay? Um, in terms of his runs tally, Craig scored 214 runs across the three innings. He batted, obviously, the highest score of 182 in that massive partnership, uh, that triple century partnership he put on with Tay Shandapal in the first test. Average 71 um, across the series. His other scores outside of the 182 in the series, he got a 25 and 7. So much like Tay, he didn't cash in after the big 182, but we can't hold that against him. Uh, that's Craig, what was that? That was Craig's 12th. Um, test match century by far and away the highest um, accumulator in the region in terms of the modern era in terms of this current set of players only Darren Bravo is behind him with eight test match centuries in terms of anybody who's actually close to him and Darren's not even in the squad much less um, so for Craig another victorious series we wrapped up the second test inside effectively two and three quarter days <sighs> Nine out of 10 for Craig. Nine out of 10, because he's the captain at the end of the day. Nine out of 10 for Craig. Of course, if you disagree with these, get in the comments below. Uh, let me know. Send us an app at Kyle Cricket. Um, happy to hear your feedback. Moving on to number three. <laughs> Raymond Reefa, the third top run scorer in the series. 113 runs, 
at an average of 38. 250s. 250s. His maiden um, test match 50s. So it's his three scores across the um, across the series. 2, 58 and 53. He also bowled a couple of overs in the first test. None for seven. Listen, most of you know my stance by now and I'll stick to my stance. I still don't think Reefa should have batted at three. I still don't think he should have got the chance. I still don't think that Nkrumah Bonner did anything wrong to justify not playing against Zimbabwe and then even worse, now getting dropped from the squad altogether and not travelling to South Africa. I think when you've put up Nkrumah Bonner's body of work thus far in his 15 test match career, they done him dirty. Either way, however it happened, whatever the justification and reasoning, Reefer got the spot at number three. Again, for those who don't remember, Reefer had got the spot at number three in the Bangladesh series, but didn't convert. Then he got licked down. Uh, no, didn't get licked down, sorry. He got injured in the warm-up game in Australia, so missed the whole of the Australia um, tour. So some may say, well, actually, this is just Reefer getting his chance that he should have got, given he'd got a chance in Bangladesh, against Bangladesh. Whatever. The point is, Reefer got his chance and ultimately he took his chance. He got two test match 50s and he's now locked in to, open, to, to bat at number three against South Africa. Will he do well against South Africa? Well, boy, that's a different level of test. Um, depending on what the Safa squad is, whether it includes an Engidi, a Nokia, a Rabada, he's going to come under a serious test. He's not necessarily going to have Craig and Tej put on a huge platform um, that allows him to um, kind of bed his way in. He may find that he's in to bat within the first seven overs against South Africa. I, I, I remind everyone to go back and look at the last time he played South Africa, which is in the Caribbean, in St. Lucia, which, is, which are the quickest tracks in the Caribbean. And we got skittled out. 97, 140 odd, 150 odd, 160 odd. We got skittled out. So this is, this is a serious bowling attack in their own conditions. That's not for me to discredit what Reefer's done. Big up Raymond Reefer. 250s, I can't knock that. But bigger tests are coming and I wait to see how he adapts to them. But he, my point being, he deserves now the chance to adapt to them. If, But he may be found wanting. But based on the Zimbabwe series, 250s, couple men in the side would be killing for 250s right now to secure their place. Um... What should we give Reefa? Two fifties, two test match fifties. And the first 50, the, the, the second 50 was crucial, actually, in terms of helping us establish a lead after we'd skittled Zimbabwe out in the first innings. Let's give Reefa a uh, some seven and a half, or should I give him eight? Seven and a half or eight out of ten. Um, moving on to number four. Number four in the order is Jermaine Blackwood. Uh, Jermaine Blackwood, 84 runs across his three innings, an average of 28. <sighs> That's subpar. So when you just look at it in terms of the average, it's subpar. And it's not going to do anything to kind of get some of the people. The, 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 it's not going to do anything to keep the doubters away from his, away from his door. Jermaine Blackwood has now played 52 test matches. Uh, 300 17 50s, of which one of those 50s came in the second test. Um, and sorry, he got the sorry, I want to come out. One of those 50s came in the first test, he got 57 uh, in the second innings of the first test, and that 57 more than likely just keeps it takes a tiny bit of pressure off him. But you see, that 22 that he got in the second test. Again, people say, well, Jermaine, you get, you, when you get out, you allow yourself to get out far too easily. Bear in mind that in Australia, Jermaine scored 36, 24, 3 and duck. So his last seven test match innings are 36, 24, 3, duck, 5, 57, 22. There is going to be pressure on Jermaine Blackwood. I can't, I, I can't defend Jermaine here from the people who are going to rightly say, well, boy, Jermaine, you best produce in South Africa. Because I agree, Jermaine best produce in South Africa. But that doesn't mean you ignore the fact that he still hit a Test Match 50 in this series. 
I've always maintained, I think I said it on one of our recent videos, but I've always maintained that the issue for Jermaine Blackwood is people judge him against a higher set of criteria than they judge other players. And I suspect the reason why they do is because they recognize that Jermaine Blackwood is a very good player. But they don't, I don't think Blackwood is judged the same way that some people might judge a a Mayers or a Reef or whatever. I think they hold Blackwood to higher regard. Maybe because he's a vice captain. I don't know. Either way, he got a 50. Um, it's worth mentioning the only players in the team that hit 50s were... No, in fact, Mo, so Carl Mayers didn't hit a 50. His average was better than Jermaine's, but Mayers didn't hit a 50. So it's worth, I think, just pointing out that if we're going to cuss Jermaine, we have to recognise that Mayers didn't hit a 50. So wherever you're putting Jermaine... If you're going to disregard what he did, you have to look at Mayers and go, well, he didn't hit a 50. Do you, do you see where I'm coming from? So anyways, Jermaine Blackwood, a 50, average 28, that's subpar, six and a half. Six and a half for Jermaine. Some might even say six. Number five, Carl Mayers. So Carl Mayers, three innings, one not out, 67 runs, an average of 34. This is why sometimes you can't go by averages because that average of 34 will make it look like Mayers had a, a good series. But then you have to look at his scores in the series. 20, 17 not out, 30. Because of that not out, his average goes up to 34. So on paper, it looks like he's had a better series than Jermaine Blackwood. Jermaine averaged 28 because he's had three completed innings. That not out from Mayers pushes his average to 34. So then I put it to you lot listening. Of those two players, who had the better series, Mayers or Blackwood? Mayer's averaged 34, Blackwood's averaged 28, but Blackwood got a 50. Mayer's got 20, 17 not out, and 30. So I'm not looking at the average there for Carl Mayer's, and I like Carl Mayer's. Um, I've got some long-term doubts about Mayer's and Holder and if they should be competing for the same spot, but I like a Carl Mayer's, right? But I think we've got to look at that average and be like, mm, let's be careful here. Carl Mayer's 6 out of 10. That actually might even be five out of 10. Now, Carl Mayers might say in return or in retort to that, but Mash, that 17 not out that I got in the second innings, we declared, what do you want me to do? And I hear that. I hear that. So there is, there's validity in that. If we hadn't declared because we're pushing for a victory, does Mayers go on to score more? I don't know. Um, and actually, based on that, actually, let me push it to five and a half. Let me push it to five and a half. He didn't bowl at all in the second test, right? And the reason why I point that out, um, so in the first test, sorry, he bowled, he got not, none for 22 and none for six in the respective Zimbabwe innings. But the reason why I point out that Mayers didn't bowl at all in the second test is, I think it's Fleckers on Twitter, at Fleckers, uh, sent a message to us and said, if Mayers isn't going to bowl, does he deserve to be in the West Indies side as a batter alone? Well, listen, that that's that's a question for another Caribbean cricket podcast episode um, and video. So I've put that down in my notes as a as an episode to do in the future because I do think there are question marks to be asked about Mayers, but those are the same questions for Holder, etc. So we'll get to that. I've noted it. So Carl Mayers five and a half five and a half out of ten. Um, number six. Who bats number six in this side? I can't even remember. Oh, Ross and Chase. So Ross and Chase. Having gone to Australia as the frontline spinner and failed to do whatever his job was supposed to be, because he got himself a 50 in Australia, he got a promotion. And he went, he's been, he was selected to go to Zimbabwe and go straight back into the top six. Ah, boy. I've done a video on Ross and Chase before. Uh, and another video, part two, might need to come here because that is one of those selections where selectors have legitimate questions to answer about how could they're just the whole process there's just answers there and i was somebody who said that i expect roston to go to zimbabwe because of the 50s but i said that it didn't make sense given that he'd gone to australia as a frontline spinner but whatever the point is roston's back in the side and you know what check this out he's now earned his spot in the side whether he deserves to or not be there, he's now earned it. Much like Raymond Reefer, if you get an opportunity, whether you deserve that opportunity or not, take it. And with respect to Roston Chase, let me just bring up his figures. In this series, 
Across his three innings, he scored 91 runs with the highest score of 70. He was he batted poorly. I know we were trying to bat quickly, but he batted poorly in the first test. And I was ready. I was ready for the cuss out after the first test. But in the second test, he got a 70 and a test match half century. Ends the series with a with an average of 30. That's par. That's par. That's nothing special. That's just par. But with the ball, he took three wickets um, at 29 apiece. Um, is that anything special to write home about? Ends the series with an average of 30 with the bat and 29 with the ball. If, again, the thing with Roston and ranking Roston, and again, I'll put this to everybody listening, you can only rank or rate, sorry, Roston Chase fairly if you are establishing in your head what his role is. If you think his role is to be an out-and-out batsman who bowls a tiny piece, then test match, he got a 70, his highest score in four years. And he got three wickets. If you think that's his role, you're primarily a batter and you bowl a bit and you get some bonus wickets for us, he probably ends with a seven out of 10. At least a six and a half, if not seven. If you think he's there as a bona fide all-rounder who's supposed to take wickets and bat to a... To a certain level, it's a six and a half out of 10. I'm giving him seven, but I can see how some people would rank him lower or rate him lower, dependent on what you see his actual role as. But I'm giving Ruston Chase seven. Again, get in the comments below, at us at Carib Cricket. Let me know what you think. Number seven. Number seven is Josh De Silva. And I'm putting Josh De Silva because in the second test, they, they sent in Josh ahead of Jason. Um, which, by the way, if I was Jason Holder, I would take that as the biggest indictment of how much my batting has fallen away, that they're now saying that Josh De Silva comes ahead of me in the order. And that's no disrespect to Josh De Silva. I still maintain that at some point in Josh's career, he's going to be batting inside the top five at some point, because he's probably in our top two or three most solid batters, probably three in this current side, right? He averages 29 after 20 um, test matches, 100, 350s. And that would probably be better if he didn't always have to bat with the tail at number eight. But anyways, the point is they've moved Josh ahead of Jason now. And in this series, Josh um, scored three not out, nine not out, and a 44. He took six catches in the first, te uh, first test, three catches in the second test, and one stump him. It's a solid return from Josh. That's a solid return. Disappointing that he missed out on the test match 50. I think in the second test he got done by, was he, I think he was, I think he was dumb. I think Nayuchi got an, a nipper backer, uh, which took out his off stump. Um, and it was a good delivery in fairness, but it was a solid 44. He ends with 56 runs in the series and an average of 56. Again, remember he's got some not outs there. I actually thought some of his, keeping behind the stumps there was a lot of buys in that second test and I, I still think that Josh can keep better to spinners sometimes um but that, I'm no wicket keeper who what do I know but I, these are just little things that I've picked up on but overall it was a solid series for Josh um seven out of ten seven out of ten for Josh some of you might say higher but seven out of ten for me maybe seven and a half mm. seven seven out of ten uh Jason Holder uh, with the bat, he was woeful. Um, 11, 14 runs across the series on his two times at bat, average of seven. Um, that sec that dismissal in the second test where we, we I think Rain had interrupted the start of the day and we came out on like 290 for eight and Jason just wafts it as like his third or fourth uh, delivery that had been bowled in the day. And I just thought, you know what, Jason, that kind of sums up where your batting's at right now. Um, so Jason flopped with the bat and actually bear with me, people. Let me just bring up something to show, to, to kind of articulate to people what I'm kind of saying about Jason's batting right now, because it has fallen off. Um, so Jason with the bat, these are Jason holders last since Sri Lanka, since, since the Sri Lanka series, in Sri Lanka at the end of 2021. These are Jason Holder's um, scores with the bat. 36, duck, 4, 3. That was Sri Lanka. Then England, 45, 
37 not out, 12, duck, duck, did not bat. Then Australia, 27, 3, duck, 11. Then Zimbabwe, 11, did not bat, 3, did not bat. This video is about ranking Jason Holder based on the Zimbabwe series, but I can't do that without also pointing out the, the context that his batting for me has just fallen off. It's just fallen off. I think, what what's the Jason average with the bat right now to show you how badly it's fallen off? Uh, let me see. His average with the bat right now. It's gone. It's under 30. It used to be 32. It's now 29 and low 29s at that. Um, but with the ball, Jason was good with the ball. Not so much in the first test, but the second test. Five wickets across the series at 20 apiece. Um, you got to respect that. Uh, like I say, particularly in the second test, I think the first test he looked off. He just looked off it in the first test. I don't think I don't think he bowled good lengths. Uh, didn't get the ball to do a whole lot. Uh, he still, I mean, he took two for 55 and none for 13. But the second test, he was accurate, super accurate. Two for 18, one for 16. And like I say, ends the series with five wickets at 20. Um, that's possibly better figures than he bowled overall, but it still is what it is, you know? He, he was he was the best pacer in terms of contributing or well, not. I thought Alzari Joseph was the best pacer, but in terms of figures... Jason Holder was the best pacer, five wickets at 20. And that kind of saves him with regards to the poor batting. Um, so because of the bowling contribution, I give Jason a seven. The only reason I won't give him higher is because the batting looks, it just looks off for me. It looks completely off. Um, so Jason Holder at eight. Who, who's nine? Alzari Joseph at nine. Nothing to write home about. The bat, he only batted once. Um, but with the ball, so... You look at the figures, Alzari Joseph, five wickets at 29. But I would actually argue that Alzari Joseph was much better than those figures suggest. I thought he bowled in this series like I am the pack leader, not Shannon Gabriel, not Kimar Roach. I'm Alzari Joseph. I, I, I am now comfortable in my own skin at test match level. I am the I am the pack leader. Kimar, so Kimar Roach is 34. Shannon Gabriel is 34. I now believe that Alzari Joseph is ready soon to take on the mantle as pack leader with the ball um, for West Indies. His overall figures are still relatively poor given his talent. 72 test match wickets at 36 apiece. But that's gone down quite significantly over the last year. You kind of have to judge Alzari Joseph by how... He's been bowling. I'm just bringing it up for people to know how he's been bowling over the last year. He's 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 now taking consistent test match wickets. Um, let me just bring it up for you lot to... I know, again, it's about player rating for Zim, but I still want to paint some context. So if we go back to Bangladesh, in fact, go back to England last summer. So um, first test versus England, he took five wickets in that test match. Second test versus England, well, that was the... That was that flat track at Kensington, so we'll ignore that one. Third test against England, three wickets in the match. First test, Bangladesh, six wickets. Second test, Bangladesh, six wickets. Australia was hard going, but in the in the second test against Australia, he took five wickets. And then Zimbabwe, first test, three wickets. Second test, two wickets. I think there's a level of consistency that is now coming to Alzari's test match bowling. So I have to rate and I have to respect it on... on on the surface, his figures don't look as good as Jason Holder's, but I thought he bowled with good zip, good aggression. And I, th I thought he was a setup man. I think a lot of people got wickets because of Alzari setting the situation up. So Alzari Joseph, five wickets at 29. I'm going to give him seven because I, I feel like I can't give him more than Jason, given Jason's, um, Jason's uh, figures are better. No, I'm giving Alzari seven and a half. Some of you will cuss me and say, how can you do that when Jason's figures are better? But I just thought, I thought Alzari was the setup man for the whole tour. So I'm, I'm respecting that. Uh, good to catch Moti. <laughs> 10 out of 10 there. How about that? Let's just end it quick. There's nothing, I don't need to say nothing there. 19 wickets in the series at 14. 19 wickets at 14. In the second test, he took 13 wickets in the test match at 99. I think it was what what what's the records that people say is broken the best ever? Was it the best ever 
performance by a West Indian, was it bowler or spinner away from home? Whichever one is in the record books. Good Akesh Moti and, and people who like Good Akesh Moti and support Good Akesh Moti will say that this is long overdue. Yeah, I, I, I'd, I'd agree to an extent. But more importantly, what I want to see going forward from here, which is historically what West Indies don't do, is they don't give a spinner a good run. The only spinner I can think of in recent times that West Indies gave a good run to is Ashley Nurse and maybe a Davindra Bushu, right? Moti now needs to get a run, which is which means we're always going to play a spinner. It's always going to be Moti because we trust him. And even if it doesn't go well, we're still going to invest in him. They didn't do it with Rakeem. They didn't do it with Sammy Permol. They haven't done it with Jamel Warrican. So maybe they'll now do it with Goodakesh Moti. Give the boys props and give him a run now to feel like he's trusted to be a match winner. 10 out of 10, good to catch multi. Go well. Um, Shannon Gabriel uh, came in for the second test. It's going to be very interesting to see how we utilize Shannon and Kimar in South Africa. Um, but Shannon came in for the second test. I thought he bowled. The, the figures say one wicket for 39 runs um, across the two innings uh, that he bowled. But again, much similar to Alzari Joseph, I thought Shannon bowled with good zip. I think he could have. He's unlucky to have not got a couple more wickets. Um, I think he, I think he flustered a lot of the Zimbabwean batters because he bowled with that hostile pace that only him and Alzari Joseph can do. It's like I say, it's gonna be very interesting to see how they use Shannon in South Africa because I don't know. I doubt his body can get him through two back-to-back -back tests, but. Knowing how South African um, conditions play, I don't see how we go in without Alzari and Shannon Gabriel. Um, so good return to Test match cricket for Shannon Gabriel. I hope we utilize him properly going forward. I'm going to give him six and a half for that return to Test match cricket. And then lastly, Kimar Roach. So Kimar Roach played the first Test. Yes, it wasn't. Um, yes, it wasn't a track that was conducive to to fast bowling. Kimar was tidy. He took one wicket across the two, 18 overs, one for 55 across, one for 51, sorry, across the two innings. Economy of 2.83. So Kimar was, Kimar was tidy. He didn't, he didn't give anything away. He wasn't loose, but he also wasn't penetrative with the ball. The only question mark we've got is how much of that was down to the conditions the fast bowlers were bowling in and how much of that is down to West Indies needing to accept that if we play Kimar, you only play him in certain conditions. Well, we'll soon see when we go to South Africa how much that holds up because are, is Kimar suitable for South African conditions? I don't know. Um, and possibly going forward, there's some difficult decisions for West Indies selectors to make about when and how we use Kimar. All I will say about Kimar Roach is look at how England used Broad and Anderson. Broad's still going at 36. Anderson's still going at 40. We've got the West Indian public trying to write off Kimar Roach at 34. I don't, I'm, I'm not one of those people, but I will agree that it's now time we think about we utilise Kimar where we know that Kimar is going to be very successful. Largely speaking, that means in Caribbean conditions, in England. I don't know where else. I don't know if South Africa comes into that as well. So I think it's just about player management and player workload and being wise and thinking ahead of time about how you utilize uh, your bowlers. So, yeah, like I say, wasn't penetrative, was tidy, five out of ten. And that might sound harsh, but I think Kimar himself would say he would have wanted a better wicket return. I think it's everyone, people. Yep, I think it's everyone. So, people, that's the player ratings. Nothing too tough. Not going to expand anything further. Got lots of more video content coming up in the next few days. Sink your teeth into this one. Let me know in the comments below what you think about the ratings. Um, yeah, you know the drill by now. Like the video, share the video, subscribe to Caribbean Cricket Podcast. And if you've got any loose change, become a patron at www.patreon.com forward slash Carib Cricket. Thank you as ever. And good night. We rule the cricket world. Now the rules. Welcome to the Caribbean Cricket Podcast, your one stop shop for all things West Indies cricket. By the fans, for the fans.